Listen for the feelings that the psalmist is trying to communicate in this song. Live forever in your sanctuary, safe beneath the shelter of your wings. For you have heard my vows, O God. You've given me inheritance reserved for those who fear your name. Add many years to the life of the king. May his years span generations. May he reign under God's protection forever. Appoint your unfailing love and faithfulness to watch over him. Then I always sing praises to your name as I fulfill my vows day after day. Did my mic cut out? Is it working? Okay. So just looking here for one word descriptions about the, the feelings that, the, that are communicated here in the first four verses. What did you hear? What did you feel? A shout? Terror? What else? Heard refuge, yep. Again, looking for feeling words, what, what, the, what he was communicating. Hopeful, good. Somebody in the back said something? Pleading? Plea? Yep. Feeling safe? Trust. Yeah, all of those things are in, are in there. I think he was desperate. I get a sense of desperation. I think he has a clear sense that he knows that he needs help, that he needs a power stronger than him, higher than him. And I think there's a, there is a, a clear sense in here of a humble confidence. A humble confidence in looking for God. Almost as if he has had God's help before, right? Somebody returning to, to, to God to get help from where he knew help has come from in the past. 
that God has helped him. So what are the things here that he's confident in? Let me list these out for you. For those that are taking notes, there's at least six things here that he's confident in and maybe more, and I encourage you to look for more. Uh, But first, he's confident in a God that is there, that this God really does exist. He's confident in a God that is listening He's confident in a God that cares. He's confident that God will help. He's confident that God will continue to help. It's not just a one-time aid. And he's confident that his relationship with God is secure, that transcends time. Now we're going to look at those six things tonight as they are woven into this beautiful psalm. But think about it this way. If you are in the market for a God, if you are looking for a higher power, if you're looking for a God to believe in, wouldn't you want these six things? Wouldn't that be what you what you really need, what your soul, what your mind, what your heart needs? You want a God that's there, a God that listens, a God that cares, a God that helps, a God that continues to help, and a God that provides a secure, ongoing relationship. That's what I would want. Here in David's psalm, in Psalm 61, I think, I think David is saying to you and I, like, this is the God that you need. This is the God that you're looking for. The God that I'm telling you about. This is him right here. The one that I'm writing about. Now let's watch and see how these six things play out in the Psalms as we go through. David's God here is Jehovah. He's the God of the Old Testament. He's the God of the New Testament. Jehovah being Lord. The name Jesus being Jehovah saves. Yeshua, Jehovah saves. Um, And David's talking about him. I want to start with a very the first verse there. Right before verse 1, it says, For the choir director, a psalm of David, to be accompanied by the stringed instrument. If you haven't heard one of the ancient stringed in- instruments, what we were playing before the study started tonight, a guy, an artist by the name of Michael Levy, um, he's got a lot of albums out, but um, Derek's going to play about 30 seconds of, of the ancient lyre. This is an ancient, probably an eight-stringed, um, harp called a, I think it's Negina or Negina. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but just listen to this for a few seconds. Yeah, so we don't have the actual music of this psalm, of course, um, but we have a close instrument and the sounds that the instrument made. Um, but that would have been a similar instrument that would have, that this psalm would have been played on or sung to. Now look at verse 1. It says, Oh God, listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. Or in New King James says, Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. This is David's plea for God to listen I think it's more than a plea, though. I think there's more going on here than just a plea. You know, in those days in the ancient Near Mideast, talking to somebody of a higher rank, talking to somebody of a higher position was not a given. Somebody of a lower position had to have permission to do that. You had to have the blessing of somebody to to be able to speak to somebody of a higher position. I think David's aware of that. Most of the time, to speak, Speak to somebody of a higher position required them to invite you to speak, 
for them to give you permission to speak. Think about Esther going into the court room of King Xerxes. Um, you remember that story in, in Esther 5? Um, she wants to go in to speak, to speak on behalf of her people, the Jews. Um, and she knows that going in there that if he does not lower his scepter, meaning giving her permission to come into her, his courtroom, that the consequence of that was that she would be killed. She would be killed immediately. The eunuchs would take her out and kill her. But she goes in. You remember what she says? If I die, I must die. She, she's willing to go in and talk to him. But she, she had that respect for the king. Even though she was the queen, she still needed permission to speak to a person of higher rank. Now that's common in the, in the Old Testament times to do that. Look at, if you have your Bibles, look at Esther 5, chapter 1, Esther chapter 5, verses 1. Right before Nehemiah. <laughs> Oops, that's Ezra and Nehemiah. What am I thinking? <laughs> My bad. What's that? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Most days, I know where Old Testament books was, but today is just not one of those days, is it? Okay, Esther chapter 5. So Esther needs to go into the courtroom, and she says, it says, Three days later, Esther put on her royal robes and entered the inner court of the palace just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her, holding out the gold scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched its tip. Now, she was approaching the king. She needed to speak. How do you think that she felt? Again, looking for one word answers here. Nervous, Dwayne? Apprehensive? Desperate again. Yeah, all of that. Think about that. This is entering the presence of the king, wanting to speak. You see some similarities here between what David's doing in verse 1 of 61, Esther's approach. I think it's similar. So David here, he's making a cry for help, but I think he comes with this, this humble recognition that he doesn't belong in the king's presence, that he needs permission to speak to the king, and he's making that plea. He's saying, oh, king, please hear me out. Please listen to me. Please hear my cry. I think he probably recognizes that he, at the core, really who he is, he's a common shepherd, right? Wasn't that what he was before he was anointed? He was the common shepherd, and he's asking for an audience of the king. Isn't that what we do when we pray? Really? Aren't we, when we pray, aren't we asking for the audience of the king? When we enter into God's royal courtroom, his throne room, when we walk in there in prayer, it's really what we're doing. And I think it requires on our part that same humble confidence, that same humble approach to walking in there. When you're in despair, when you cry out to God for help, do you come in humbly recognizing that you really don't deserve to be there? Or do you come in to God's throne room angry or demanding I know I've done both there's been times where I've been frustrated with God's choices for my life and I've come in angrily without that humble approach without being humble about not deserving being in there you might be thinking that doesn't Paul instruct us in the New Testament to come into come boldly to God's throne? He does, right? Look at Hebrews 4.16. 
So the book of Hebrews is a defense for Jesus being the access to God. It's a he, Hebrews is the book of Hebrews is written like a legal document defending how to enter into the God, into God's presence by the blood of Jesus. Verse 14 it says chapter 4 verse 14 that is why we have a great high priest who has gone to heaven Jesus the son of God let us cling to him and never stop trusting him trusting who him right not ourselves this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses for he faced all the same temptations we do yet he did not sin so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God there we'll, we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it. So there's clear instruction for us to come boldly into God's presence, right? But we come boldly based on what truth? That Jesus takes us there into God's presence. That we only have access to the throne because of Jesus. The boldness that we have is because of Jesus, not anything that based on ourselves. We have nothing of ourselves to bank on. When we come boldly, it's boldly, undeservedly. Does that make sense? It. It is. Yeah. It's very. It's respect. It's. Yeah. Being very respectful when we're when we're bold. So again, here just contrasting. It's not an angry boldness. It's not an entitled boldness. It's not a demanding boldness. It's an undeserved boldness bold because we can go in based on jesus we know that god will accept us because jesus because our faith and our trust is in jesus to be in god's presence well you might also be thinking doesn't boldness mean confidence have confidence to enter into god's presence well it does as well look at ephesians 3 verse 12 Ephesians 3 verse 12 says, Because of Christ, this is the New Living Translation, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come fearlessly into God's presence, assured of his glad welcome. I think the New King James uses the word confidence in there. Is that correct, Keith? Is that what it has? Yeah. Yeah, the, that, that confidence, right, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence and faith through him. So this boldness, this confidence that you and I have of speaking to God on his throne is all about Jesus. And David, I think in Psalm 61, he knows that he's undeserved when he walks in, when he's making a request of God. And he has that respect of God. He's not demanding, hey, God, listen to me. You have to listen to me. He's not. He's coming in humble with his approach to him. You know, if, for you and I, if it wasn't for Jesus, we could never have a relationship with God, right? That's the basis of our faith, right, is, is Jesus you know, God doesn't want us to be fearful of him in terms of that we can't talk to him. Anybody ever see a puppy that when you talk to the puppy and you act, you're like, come here, come over here, whatever, the, the puppy cowers down to the ground and like wiggles, comes a little closer and stops and comes a little closer and stops and sometimes they piddle on the floor, they get that scared or that anxious. I mean, God doesn't want us to be that way. He wants us to have confidence when we approach him, but confidence in Jesus only confidence through Jesus only not that we have any right to be in his presence but but he wants us to have that confidence that boldness here with the proper respect understanding who we are with understanding of who God is so David here in Psalm 61 he he speaks to God with his humble confidence he's asking God to be his audience he says, hear my cry, O God, attend my prayer. Now back in Psalm 61, hear my cry, O God, attend my prayer. I think he's acknowledging here that God hears prayers. And isn't that what we want in God? We want God to hear our prayers. I do. Of course we do. But he doesn't presume that God attends to all prayers. There's a difference in that, right? God listening to your prayer and God attending to your prayer. God doing something 
about that. That's a big difference. It reminds me of old Garth Brooks songs probably from, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Anybody know that song? Garth Brooks, any country fans? Not too many, okay. Well, Garth Brooks, Garth Brooks um, who is a believer, by the way, Garth Brooks wrote a song called Sometimes I Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. And he wrote this song after his fiance broke up with him. And he was praying that God would send her back. And he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that God would send her back. And God never did. He ended up marrying somebody else who was way better for him than his fiance, his first fiance was. And then he wrote that song. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. What's interesting here, what did God know about Garth that Garth didn't know himself? What was that back there? Yeah, he knew what he needed. Right? God knew what Garth needed. Who was going to be better for him? What was who was best for Garth? Not Garth, right? And when you and I pray, when you and I say to God, God, hear my cry, right? We have to come in with that humility that God knows better than we do what we need. We ask for what we think is best, what we want at the time, right? But submitting to the fact that God can give better. Submitting to that with that we have that mindset, that recognition that that God knows us best. He knows us better than ourselves. Now, would David ask God to attend to his prayer or answer his prayers if he didn't believe God was there? No. Again, this is another one of those points. David expresses humble confidence in God's existence, that God is actually there. When I was 19 and 20, I was, I was looking for reasons to believe in the God of the Bible. I had lots of reasons not to, most of those emotional reasons, um, not a lot of intellectual ones, but I started pursuing intellectual pathway, started pursuing the questions like, how do you know God exists? How do you know that there's just one truth and not multiple truths? How do you know that other religions of the, bi- other religions of the world are not also true? And as I pursued that, I went to a place called Libri, and Libri is a word in France, in French that means shelter. And it's a place where you can go and ask questions. And, and the guy that was the director of the Libri where I went, um, he was a very, very wise man who I grew to, ha- to love and have a lot of respect for. He, he attended to my questions. He would listen to me and listen to my reasons and listen to the, the, the questions I had about faith and about God and about truth. But it wasn't so much what he said that drew me into a faith with God. But I remember sitting with him at a meal, and he bowed his head to pray. And when he prayed, he prayed like he believed that God was there and that he was talking to him. The first time I heard him pray, I remember bowing my head, and he started to pray, and he start, he sounded like he was talking to somebody that was really there. I literally looked up and looked at him like, for real? Like that, it had that, that impact on me. He prayed like he believed that God was really there. See, David expresses that confidence. That same confidence that God is there. Yeah, you and I can't touch God, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we could crawl up into his lap sometimes? <laughs> we would all want that, right? But we, we live with this faith that he is there. Yes, yeah, sometimes our faith gets diminished. Sometimes it's harder to see that he is there. But he is there. And David has that confidence in him as well. And if, he, if God does exist, another question would be, does God want to listen to me? David's pleading for God, saying, hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. He's assuming that God wants to listen to him. Well, Proverbs 15, verse 8, has something to say about that. Does God want to listen to me? Little old me, I'm just one of seven billion people in this world. Why would God want to listen to me? Doesn't he have enough to do elsewhere? Proverbs 15, verse 8, speaks to that. 
It says, The Lord hates the sacrifice of the wicked, but he delights in the prayers of the upright. Not just wants to listen, but delights in. Doesn't it feel good when somebody delights in you? Somebody cherishes you that much, somebody loves you that much, somebody values you that much that they delight in you. That's God for you. That's what God feels when you acknowledge Him, when you close your eyes to pray. God delights in the prayers of the upright. Back in Psalm 61, verse 2, it says, From the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Again, David here is continuing with the same humble confidence, and he seems to be saying it doesn't matter how far life's taken him or how far he's allowed life to take him from God, that he can go to God, that he knows where God is. He can turn to God for help. Question for me, question for you is, how far has life taken you? How far have you allowed life to take you from God? And it doesn't matter where David ended up. And we all know that David had some pretty dark years of his life, right? Some very dark, ugly events, some very bad choices that he made, some time periods of his life where he walked away from God. Um, But he knew where God was. He knew how to turn back to God and where God would be. He knew that God was there on his throne. I'll tell you a story about Daniel. I know I tell a lot of stories about my son Daniel, but I think that God gave me my son Daniel because one of the reasons, because God would use him to change me, and God has done that. When Daniel was 18 months old, a lot of you know this story, Daniel had a lot of severe health problems. He has vascular malformations in his brain, Um, where arteries and veins were growing in places that they shouldn't. Um, And consequently, there was parts of his brain that that were not getting oxygen or blood flow that should have been getting oxygen and blood flow. There's a big chunk of his brain back here that's completely dead. It's just white matter on the MRI. There's not a gray matter on the MRI. There's no blood flow. Uh, But in in that time period, Daniel was in and out of hospitalizations, just surgery after surgery. At one point, he was in a coma for a while. um, And... And life was tough. It was hard for my wife and I. And I had a friend come up to me from work who was a believer who said these words to me. She said to me, Dwayne, the last time I checked, God was still on his throne. The last time I checked, God was still on his throne. Now, that wasn't kind words, right? But it was truth words. It was words that I needed to hear that reminded me that despite the chaos and the pain and the craziness that was happening in my life in the present, that God was the constant sitting on his throne, and that he was in charge, that he was there. Right? And I think David here expresses that same confidence. He's saying, from the end of the earth, I will cry to you. It doesn't matter how far he goes or what happens in his life. When my heart is overwhelmed, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, when when life is spinning around me, when my plate is too full, when I can't carry anything else, when I have too many balls juggling in the air, whatever, whatever imagery you have, he's saying, God, you're there and I can turn to you. And God delights in that when we do that. few years later after my friend said that to me her husband had a massive stroke um, and ended up needing a part of his skull removed um, ended up being at Hershey Medical Center for for quite a long period of time he recovered somewhat um, hasn't recovered much since then Um, and I went back to her and um, and I sat with her and I said to her The last time I checked, God was still on his throne. And she thanked me for that. Um, That same truth that that comforted me 
also comforted her and I think it comforted David here as well do you know that God is on his throne for you Isaiah 6 verse 1 says this turn there if you have it if you don't have this imagery of God in your head then this is good imagery Isaiah 6 verse 1 says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. You ever pictured God with the train of his robe? And it being so big that it fills the temple. It was how glorious. But where is he sitting? On his throne, that's right. Hovering around him were mighty seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. With the remaining two they flew. And in great chorus they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The glorious singing shook the temple to its foundations and the entire sanctuary was filled with smoke. So where is the God that you need the God that you're designed to have a relationship with. He's God and he's sitting on his throne right where we need him, right? That's the God that we need. I think verse 2 here is about David knowing where his true north is, knowing where the guide is for his life, knowing where God is, where his security is, where his confidence is. So we know that God exists, that he wants to hear our cry. He wants to hear our prayers. But why does he care? Or does he care at all? First Peter 5 or 7 speaks of that. First Peter 5 or 7 says give the new living says give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about what happens to you give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about all cares about what happens to you how many of your worries all that's pretty comprehensive right all should we hold on to any if God wants all? No. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Sometimes when I'm feeling anxious about something, I do this prayer with God, to God, that I call my worst case scenario prayer. If I have an event in my life or something coming up and I'm anxious about it or I'm worried about it or I'm looking may be disturbed about what's going on I'll present to God what I think is the worst case scenario the worst case scenario this is what could happen this is the worst case scenario and when I do that with this, when I do that then I have this sense that God could handle my worst case scenario I gave him my worst case scenario and he could take it he could handle it it's that understanding that God is way bigger than any problem that's here. That he cares about me. He cares about all the things that I'm experiencing. He cares about all of my problems in life, all the good things, all the bad. He cares. He loves me. Again, going back to I'm just one of seven billion people on this earth. Right? Why why would he care just about little of me? I, I don't I don't know the answer to that, but I know that he does. Right? Me as an individual he cares about. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. 
Now think about that. Why would God create a way through Jesus for us to have a relationship with him if he didn't care for us individually? It wouldn't make sense. His love for us is the reason why he created a way for us to have a relationship with him. If he didn't care for us, we wouldn't have Jesus. There would be no need for that. But he does care for us. Right? So he wants to hear our cries. He wants to hear our pleas. Like David is saying, hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. At the end of verse 2, he introduces five metaphors here. This is Psalm 61, verse 2. David introduces five metaphors that give us insight into David's experience with God so far. So this isn't just him wishing to have these metaphors. He's, he's given us insight into what has been his experience in life so far already. He says at the end of verse 2, Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Does it sound like a song anybody knows? Lead me to the rock. Yeah, Lead me to the rock. The New Living Translation says, To the towering rock of safety. It's actually a little better translation in the New Living Translation than the New King James. The Hebrew word here actually refers, would actually mean a high rocky summit, higher than your current position. So, so if you're in a lower position and you can get to a higher position, you're, you're safer. Does that make sense? Especially if you're being attacked or you're being chased, um, somebody's trying to get you. But these rocky summits were invaluable in military scenarios because they were much easier to defend. Derek, could you put up the picture of Masada? It's a big flat. Yeah. So this is Masada. This is the fortress here um, that Herod built. This is Herod's home on here, and his baths are down in here. Um, and you can actually go there. When, when you go to Israel, or if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, you, take a, you can get up there on a cable car that's on this side um, that comes right to here. And then you can walk around up there and see the, the remains. But that is where there was a fortress. And Herod had built that in defense of Rome's western border. Rome's western border was right here. It was, it was the end of Roman territory. On the other side of this, of here, you can see up there on the left, that's the Salt Sea. The other side of the Salt Sea was all enemy territory. So Herod had built a fortress to protect Roman territory, to protect Israel, Roman territory from there. And he built it on this high, rocky outcropping. Why? Because he could defend it. You can't get up there. When the Romans finally conquered this, this is where the remaining Jews were and when, they, when, when Israel was sacked in AD 70. This was the last place that there were Jews that were alive. When the Romans finally took it, they, they took that by building this rampart right here. They filled that in by hand. They carried the dirt up there. Thousands and thousands and thousands, years and years of people carrying dirt and rocks up there to build it. And you can see right here that it's, it's actually slightly lower than the top. And that the reason that happened, it, it was, it used to be the whole way to the top, but there was a big earthquake and it dropped about 20 feet or 30 feet. Um, but it used to go right to the top. But when you have a high position like this, it's easier to defend. The enemy can't get to you nearly as easily. So when David is saying, he's saying, lead me to a rock that is higher than I, he's talking about his need to be at a place where he can't be attacked. And who is he talking about here? To God. Right? God is his rock that is higher than I. You and I need that place in our life. You and I need that place where we can go. That's what he's talking about here. Interesting, also, when you look at the pictures of Jerusalem, Derek, if you could put that up. Jerusalem was also built on a high rocky summit. Um, this is a picture, an artist's rendition of ancient Jerusalem. Um, you can see it there. There's valleys surrounded. You can put the next picture up. This is a topo map. Uh, this is a, an actual picture that they subtracted out the, some of the topography. They, they subtracted out 
the buildings, etc. And it's showing in the circle here is Mount Moriah. Remember, Mount Moriah is where Jerusalem is. So right here is the ancient city of David in the lower part here. Um, the Temple Mount is middle um, and then higher up there. But what's, what surrounds Jerusalem, which is why Jerusalem is so valuable for a military place, for a fortress, for a, a place for a king to live, is that they had these deep valleys surrounding it. The one on this side is the Kidron Valley. Over here is the Mount of Olives. It ex extends down to here. Um, this is the Valley of Hinnon, which Greek is Gehenna. We'll talk about that in a second, which is really interesting because Gehenna is the New Testament word for hell. Um, and then the Triropian Valley, which goes right along the western wall of the temple. Um, now, Jerusalem was, was built there by the Jebusites, who, I'm sorry, but whoever had it before the Jebusites, I don't know who that was, but the Jebusites lived there when David conquered it, when David finally took it, 200 years after the Israelites came into the Promised Land. They had not conquered it. David went in with his men, and they, and they finally conquered it. They took it, um, but Jerusalem was built on a high rocky outcropping. It's what they, it's what they needed as a defense. It was an easier place to defend. It was a place that they could be safe. So David is talking about these t these places, these high rocky outcroppings that are places that are higher than I. Now, just a side here, I want to talk a little bit about this Valley of Gehenna. This is off topic from our our psalm, but the Valley of Gehenna here, this valley, the Greek word is Gehenna, and that is what is used for the word for hell in Matthew um, 5, verse 22. That is the place where corpses of criminals were burnt, it was a place where unclean animals, their corpses were burnt. It was a place where the city's trash was burnt. Now think about that. That's right here. Where was Jesus crucified? Yeah, right up there. Right up close to the top of that oval. Somewhere in that area up there was where he was crucified. Right? He's talking about hell the vivid imagery, when, he's, when Jesus is talking about hell, the vivid imagery of, of burning criminals' bodies, burning animals' bodies, burning trash. You think that wouldn't have stuck in their brain? Right? Yeah. And it would have been within smelling distance of the cross, depending on how the wind was blowing. Think about that. Salvation on the high rocky summit that close to Gehenna, where bodies of criminals were burnt, where the bodies of animals were burnt. What's also interesting about this valley here, it has a dark, dark history as well. Um, it is where babies were sacrificed to Moloch in Leviticus. And they addressed that. It's where the Molochs sacrificed babies. They did that as well by, by burning babies. They sacrificed, they would place the babies on Moloch's arms and then they would have a hot fire come out of the mouth and burn up the babies. Also what happened in the valley of Hinnon in here is the field of Adelkama, where, is Ju where Judas hung himself. It's right, I'm not sure exactly where, but when you go there, it's, oh, I think it's over here, right in this area. Um, you can see that when you go to Israel. Now, Back to our story. You know, David's longing for that protection. He's saying, lead me to that rock that is higher than I. Lead me to that high rocky fortress. Verse 3 says, for you've been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. You've been a shelter for me. Have you found God to be your shelter? shelter for your soul the shelter that will save you from Gehenna, from hell and the consequences of your sin 
Matthew 10, verse 28 says, Do not be afraid of those who want to kill you. They cannot kill your soul. Only Jesus protecting us. Right? Jesus is the one who can protect us. Matthew 8, 36, look at that verse. It's not 8.36. Hmm. Well, maybe it's 9.36. It's the what shall it profit if a man... Oh, I'm sorry. Mark 8.36. Start with verse 35. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will find true life. And how do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul in the process? New King James says, what does it profit of man? What does it profit of man if he loses his soul? He gains the whole world but loses his, his soul. So that idea is that, that here that David knows that God is the shelter, not just for himself, but shelter for his soul. That in the end, he's talking about you know, living forever. Verse 4, I'll abide in your tabernacle forever. That his, his life doesn't live forever, but he knows that his soul, he knows that he will live with God forever, and he needs God to be his shelter. He needs God to be his, his protection This idea of shelter that's used in verse 3, this is clear testimony from David about God being his shelter. When is it that we need shelter in our lives? During a storm, right. On the elements, we need, we need shelter from the wind. We need shelter from the sun. We need shelter from rain. We need shelter from cold. We need shelter from sandstorms if you live in the Middle East. We need shelter from a lot of things. But you also need shelter from your enemies. You need shelter from animals that are attacking you, right? We're, we're, we're vulnerable. We might be the like you know, an, an animal from a humanistic perspective. You know, we might be the highest ranking animal, but we are very vulnerable, right? We, 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 are, we need shelter. And God designed us that way. It's like sheep. They, they were designed to have a shepherd. Right? We need the shelter of a shepherd here. And David's proposing here that what he's saying is that God is my shepherd for you have been my shelter for me. You have been a strong tower for me. Now in this metaphor that he uses in that second line there, the strong tower, now this might be a continuation of the word shelter, but it gives again this idea of military implication of of strong tower. Other translations use the word fortress. The pictures that we showed of Masada, the fortress that was on top of there, that's the fortress, the high tower on top of the high rocky summit there. It's the idea of, of even harder to reach when you're in the fortress that's high up. Now, with modern day weapons, of course, those places are easily reached, right? With drones, with airplanes, with missiles, all those things. But back in those days, they didn't have that. <laughs> they had bows and arrows. It wasn't for another couple hundred years after this before they, they had started having machines of war where, where the Babylonians had perfected some more, modern, more machinery that could launch things farther and things like that. Um, but David here is talking about people that could only attack based on getting there by foot or by horse, launching arrows, uh, launching rocks from slings, those types of things. So a fortress was, was um, something that was coveted very much. And he's saying, God, you are my shelter. You are my strong tower from the enemy. David acknowledges that without God protecting him, there really isn't any protection at all. Look at Psalm 127, verse 1.
Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is useless. Unless the Lord protects the city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. It's that humble recognition, again, that it's God who provides the protection for us. What's interesting here, and this is not part of the Psalms, what's interesting is that he doesn't tell us not to protect ourselves. So don't guard. But he says it implies acknowledging that God is the one who does the guarding, right? We do our part, God does his part as well. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. Right? That God is ultimately the one who provides the protection. Now the next two metaphors in verse 4, David uses to describe his experience with God. And it involves a change of tense here. Look at verse 4 of Psalm 61. It says, I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. I will abide. I will trust. This is future tense here. The word that's used here for tabernacle actually means, also means tent. Think about that. Tabernacle, what was built in the Old Testament, was what was built, um, what Moses had in the desert with him. That was a tent. They called it the tabernacle, but it was a fabric tent. It was elaborate. It was a big tent for sure, but nonetheless, it was a tent. And the tent is a place of shelter, but it's also a place where God lived. It's a place where God met his people. The temple wasn't, wouldn't be built for another 50 years after David's writing this. Um, so the temple wasn't in place at that point. So he's talking about the tent where God lives. Look at Exodus 25, verse 8. Do you know what the purpose of the tabernacle was? The purpose? Yeah, it was, it was God's presence. It was a meeting place. 25, verse 8. This is why God had the, tab- had the, t- the tabernacle built said, I want, Exodus 25, verse 8, I want the people of Israel to build me a sacred residence where I can live among them. Think about that. The God of the universe choosing to live in the desert in a tent. Why? So he could be with the people that he loved. David here in Psalm 61 is saying, I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I want to live in your house, God. I want to be with you. You're the Father. I'm your son. I want to be with you forever. I want to live with you forever, with your shelter, with your protection. Then he says, the end there, verse 4, I will trust in the shelter of your wings. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. I think this is a David acknowledging an ongoing relationship with God that transcends the physical life. Yes, he had enemies in the present. Yes, he was pursued. Yes, there were people that tried to kill him. Even his own son tried. To, his sons tried to take over his throne at one point. Um, and I don't know where in David's life that this was written, probably mid-reign somewhere, but I'm not sure. We're not sure exactly. Um, but David had real enemies in the present, but he knew that his life, his soul was secure with God for eternity. That he had eyes to see past the physical, to eyes that could look beyond death and know that he would be with God forever. I don't know about you, but that gives me great comfort. To know that that I will live with God forever. That I will be with him in his presence forever. And I can trust in in the shelter of his wings. Derek, could you show that video of the hen? If you haven't ever seen this, of chicks actually going underneath the wings of a hen, it's pretty interesting.
relationship with God is that way, but, but we have to choose to go under those wings, right? God provides those wings for us. He provides that for us so that, so that we have that shelter, that protection. And he wants to do that not just in the physical, not just in the present here. He wants to do that for eternity for us. That our lives are protected by him for eternity. Our souls are protected by him for eternity. So David's saying, I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings forever. I just want to close with a quick story. Just a story that, that talks about transcending the physical how about God providing safety in the, the physical and eternal as well? This is another Daniel story. When when Daniel was in the NICU at Hershey Med, this is the day after he was born. Um, Daniel was in the neonatal intensive care. And Daniel was, um, because my wife's water broke so early, he lived in a dry womb inside my wife for several for several weeks, several months actually. Um, and so because he did not have the amniotic fluid, to breathe while he was in the womb, his lungs were underdeveloped. And when he was born, born with small underdeveloped lungs, he, trying to breathe air, he really, really, really struggled. And they, they hooked him up to a machine called an oscillating ventilator. I know I've shared this story here before, but a lot of you are new. The uh, oscillating ventilator is a ventilator that breathes like a dog pants, just super, super, super fast, like that, that panting. And they found that that helps a, um, babies absorb oxygen better. Well, despite all of that, Daniel's oxygen saturation was about 60 to 62 percent. And humans, like we need it to be around 98, honestly, for us to do well. People that smoke, people that have damaged lungs are, are lower, but God designed us to have near 100 percent oxygen saturation. Daniel was hovering w- with all the assistance. He was hovering there, and I was beside him praying. He was three and a half pounds when he was born. His his diapers were the width of a dollar bill. Uh, he was tiny. Um, and I was praying. I had my my finger, my hands, touching his big toe, and his big toe was like the end of an eraser. That's how small it was. And I was praying, and I was praying to God, and I was praying that God just spare his life, save him. And in my, with my eyes closed, I, I was praying, and I saw my son Daniel sitting on God's lap. And I saw him sitting there. And I thought that that meant that my son Daniel had passed because Daniel was sitting on God's lap. But I didn't hear the machines go off. I opened my eyes. Daniel was still breathing. He was still alive. And then it occurred to me what that meant. What God had showed me in that prayer was this, that in life and in death, Daniel will sit on God's lap. That you and I have a a line that we can't see past, right? We can't see past the physical with these eyes. But with the eyes that God gives us through his word, we can see the eternal. And we can have confidence in God for that. That despite death, we will sit on God's lap. And we can trust in that relationship. We can trust in that God. That's the God that David was praying to here. And if you don't know that God, he wants to know you. He wants to offer you. He wants to be your high tower. He wants to be your rocky protection. He wants to be your shelter from the storms. He wants to give you all of that. How do you do that? Acknowledging that you need him. Acknowledging that you're a sinner. Acknowledging that you need Jesus' salvation for you. And God welcomes you. If you're interested in talking more about that afterwards, I invite you to come talk to me. Talk to one of the other leaders that might be here. Just ask somebody. We'd be glad to pray with you about that. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for sharing with us David's insights into you, his experience with you. Thank you for giving him those words, for inspiring him. Thank you, God, 
that David saw you as his shelter, as his high tower, as his place that was higher than himself, as his fortress, that he could see that he could have a relationship with you for eternity. Lord, I know that you make that available to all of us, and I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful, God, that you are a shelter in the time of storm. I pray, God, that each person here experiences that. Lord, would you remind us of your words as we go through our week, that you are our shelter. You are our high tower. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.